Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Hey, we're starting a brand new series today, excited about it. The series is called Whatever is Good. Whatever is good, all good and perfect things come from above. The concept of this series is, and because I get frustrated doing counseling sessions with people, they're like, I'm going through so many bad things. Why is God doing this to me? Okay, that's what the series is about. Can you say this with me? God is good all the time. There is no evil in him. Right, so if we actually believe that, that God is good and that there's no evil in him, then God does not use bad things to teach us good lessons. Why would we even think that, right? Why would we think to teach our kids to not play in traffic, we put them in the road to get hit by a car to teach them, this is why you don't play in traffic. This is why you don't go in the street. Right, that's abusive. We would never do that to our kids. We would never say, don't put your hand on a hot stove. Let me show you why. See? But for some reason, we believe this concept about God. No, if there is good in the world, then there also means there is evil in the world. The Bible says, for the devil, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, but I have come that you have life and have it more abundant. That's good. That's good news, amen? Pastor John Mark did a great job wrapping up our series last week. If you did not see Pastor John Mark's message, uh, I suggest you go back and watch it. It's on our YouTube channel. If you struggle with leaving your past behind and pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call in Jesus Christ, that's the message for you. The scripture for our series is this, Philippians 4 verse 8, if you need a, a good uh, scripture that you remind yourself every day, this is one of them. This is one you should remember. The Apostle Paul writes this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. It's a command to us that we are in control of the things we think about. And unfortunately, a lot of us think about bad things. We think about depressive things. We think about angry things. We think about things constantly that are bringing us down. And this is a reminder, if you want to live a joy-filled life, we have to control our thinking. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray today, Holy Spirit, that you would rise up on the hearts and the inside of all believers. Give us peace today. Great is our peace and our undisturbed composure. You would keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Open the eyes of our understanding and lighten us to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, family. When I was six years old, I had vision problems. Naturally, my parents took me to the eye doctor and I was prescribed a pair of glasses. Well, I was not having it. I refused to wear these glasses at every turn, every try my parents made. Um, I hid the glasses in the house. I even closed my eyes when they made me wear them. One day, my mother said to me, Carrie, if you wear these glasses, I'll give you a treat. And to me, a treat meant a brownie sundae, and I would do anything for a brownie sundae. Needless to say, everything changed at this point because I didn't realize how bad my vision was. Once I put these glasses on, it was like a veil had been lifted. Everything came into sharp focus. Colors were vivid. I could make sense of the world around me. It was just a really beautiful moment. I have the glasses here with me right now. Very fashion forward for 1987. Back to you, Pastor Mike. So I can identify with Carrie, I'm 45 years old, went to the eye doctor a few months ago and realized that I had to get bifocals. Gosh, I feel very old by that. I couldn't, I couldn't settle for bifocals though. 
I had to get transition lenses, right? Transition seems so much cooler than seeing that little line and knowing that you have bifocals. But what they failed to tell me was wearing transition lenses, you were literally going to be sick to your stomach for about a month trying to figure out where to look in these glasses between reading a book and looking far distance and all that kind of stuff. And I fought it, right? Because, like, I don't feel like I'm old, but obviously 45-year-old eyes are not like young people eyes, can't read a book anymore, and you're kind of pushing it out in front of your face. But when you get those corrective lenses put on, it brings things into proper focus. And today that's what we're talking about, living life in proper focus. Putting lenses, on, oh gosh, putting lenses on or something over your eyes or within yourself to have the proper vision or focus. Now sunglasses, they're to help you not burn your eyes out, right? To kind of fix the brightness so that you can see clearly and concentrate on the things that you're trying to do. Most people will put sunglasses on when driving a car or out at the beach or hanging out outside, right? Something on the eyes to fix what I'm seeing. And many of us know a huge part of what determines the lenses through which we see the world is the things that we meditate on. How we look at the world is a reflection of the things that we're meditating on. And now, when I say the word meditate, I'm not talking about sitting crisscross applesauce with your hands. Like that's, that's not what I mean by meditating. I'm saying, what are you constantly thinking about? What are you allowing your mind to constantly think about? Is your mind constantly thinking about things that are good? Or is your mind constantly thinking about everything that's wrong? My life just sucks. Everything around me is horrible. Why is everybody so mean? New Yorkers can't drive. Right? What are you constantly thinking about? Because to meditate on the wrong things is to live your life out of focus. Does anybody in here want to feel like they want it life at the end of their life? Anybody? Just me? I don't feel like I won. I don't feel like I did something good, that I accomplished something, that I got somewhere. Well, listen, you're never going to win in life thinking like a loser. Oh, man. You're never going to win at life blaming other people for why you are where you are right now. Never, never. You actually become a prisoner. You become a prisoner of your thoughts by blaming everybody else and everything else for why you are where you are in life. See, winners don't do that. Winners don't do that. Winners do what Paul said. This one thing I do best, he said, I haven't arrived, I haven't figured it all out, I don't live a perfect life, but this one thing I do pretty well, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call. I'll tell you this, I, I do like to play sports. I'm not great at all sports, but there's a couple that I'm pretty good at. Um, I like to play golf, I'm pretty good at golf. I just started playing pickleball. Any pickleballers in the house just started out? Pretty good at that. It's like ping pong and tennis. It's pretty fun. But here's what I know about sports like that. If you beat yourself up and get hung up on a bad shot, you will ruin your whole game. You'll ruin your whole game. See, professional athletes, and especially professional golfers, that's one thing they do best. They may hit, everyone's gonna hit a bad shot. Every single one of us is gonna hit a bad shot in life at some point. But you know what they do? They brush it off and they move on to the next shot. In golf, it's called a recovery shot. It's how you recover from a bad shot that determines if you get a good score. But so many of us, we focus on the negative things of our lives. And, and I'm just gonna say society is just kind of slanted that way. Society, the news, the things that we watch on TV constantly berate our minds to think about the negative and the losses and the bad shots that it's hard to push forward. But having the right perspective 
can be the difference between having an amazing day and a horrible day. Yesterday, we were playing golf, and there was a group of four of us, and we were playing something called a scramble. Scramble means that we all play the best shot every shot. So we're all playing the same game. We're all playing the same ball. We're all playing from the same spot every single shot. And I'm sitting back and I'm like, dude, we're playing pretty amazing. Like we shot four under par, we shot a 68. I'm like, dude, we're playing amazing. And there's another guy with me, he was like, I hate golf, I never wanna play again, this sucks. Literally, we're playing the same game. We're playing the same ball. We're getting the same score. But his perspective versus my perspective, what I was looking at, what I was thinking of versus what he was thinking of was determining whether this was an amazing experience or a horrible experience. And we have that choice every single day when we go to work, when we get up with our kids, And so for me, I struggle, I do struggle with having a positive attitude all the time. There are some people, I think they're unicorns, I think they're anomalies, but there are some people who when their alarm clock goes off in the morning, they're like, good morning, Holy Ghost. I hear the birds chirping outside and I see butterflies and a hummingbird is at the feeder and oh, I'm so excited for the possibilities of today. That's not my reality. That's not how I feel when I first wake up in the morning. I wake up and I'm like, oh, my back hurts. Shoulders kind of hurting. I got my CPAP strap still engraved into my face. (laughs) Oh yeah, I I have to sleep with a breathing machine. Disconnect from all the machines before I get out of bed in the morning. (laughs) Going to the bathroom, look in the mirror like, oh. Put my bifocals on. So one of my scriptures that I have to tell myself each day To have a life-giving attitude and a life-giving personality is fine, found in Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8, it's the last chapter of Philippians. Paul gives us all these instructions uh, as a church, how to live our lives, how to conduct uh, life with each other. And then he gets to this in Philippians 4. He says, finally, in conclusion, brothers and sisters, after everything I've said in this book, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything's praiseworthy, think about these things. Don't think about the bad, think about the good. Don't think about what's horrible, think about what's pure. Think, see, you are, I am in control of what we think about. We are in control of how we respond to bad things. We're not in control of bad things happening. I'm not in control of other people. I'm not in control of someone else's attitude. I'm not in control of what comes out of someone else's mouth. But I am in control of how I respond to those situations. I say a statement to my kids, they hate it, they ask me never to say it again, but it's true. No one can make you angry. Well, then you don't know what they did, because I... (laughs) I understand that we all have buttons, and I understand we all have triggers, and I all understand that we have baggage and perception, I get all of that. But no one can actually make you feel emotionally anything. You choose that. You choose, and so I'm just sharing why I tell you that is because I I am a great person at blaming everybody else why I'm angry. Well, if you weren't such an idiot, I wouldn't be angry. If you didn't say that to me like that, I wouldn't be angry. If the dog didn't poop in the living room, I wouldn't be angry. Right, come on. Everybody's ticking me off. 
everybody, but those things can't do that. Somebody tailgating you on the highway can't make you angry. It can't. Does it? Yes, because you choose to. You choose to have road rage because someone is tailgating you on the road. But why do I tell you that? Because I felt like I was a prisoner to my emotions. I felt like I was a prisoner to everyone else's bad behavior and everyone else's bad behavior was creating bad behavior in me. And when I realized that no one has power over me, I was free. No one has the power to make me have a bad day. No one has the power to make me angry. It was freeing. It was liberating because I tend to lean towards seeing the cup half empty. I tend to lean towards negative emotion, neuroticism. And I'm wondering if there's a few areas of your life that, we, that you have been focusing on incorrectly, and maybe today we can look at this list of things that Paul says and find some freedom for ourselves. Paul gives us this list. He says, whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Think about these things. But here's the other problem in society. We don't even know what's true anymore. Because I thought the food pyramid was true. I thought I had to drink a gallon of milk every day and eat a bunch of carbohydrates to be the epitome of health. But then another report comes out, you don't need any milk after you're weaned from your mom. And you don't need carbohydrates, eat just meat. No, you can't eat just meat because then you need all the vegetables in your diet and where are you gonna get roughage from? Well, if you eat vegetables with pesticides, you're gonna get cancer. <laughs> and if you eat chips and candy bars, cancer. It's like, dear God, what do I eat? <laughs> I can only drink water, <laughs> but not at the tap. <laughs> what's, what's true? What do I focus on? What do I believe? And here's what ends up happening. We, get, we focus on the negative of the things that are happening to us instead of the positive things that are happening to us, and we get this list all kind of screwed up. So if, there, if something is true, then what's the opposite of true? False. If something is noble, what's the opposite of noble? Dishonorable. If something's right, then something's wrong. If something's pure, then something's, the list is right here. If something's lovely, then something's, if something's admirable, something's, if something's excellent, something's, if something's praiseworthy, something's, right. And so here's what happens. I'm trying to be praiseworthy, but what they're doing is disgraceful. And all we focus on is disgraceful instead of praiseworthy. I'm trying to do what's right, but everybody's doing what's wrong. And so we start focusing on everything everybody's doing wrong instead of us doing what's right. See, it's what we focus on. It's what we focus on. And, and, and it's becoming more and more of a problem. You're shopping on Amazon. You want a brand new toaster oven. You really know what toaster oven you want because all your friends got the same toaster oven. Just making this up. So you go on Amazon and you click this satanic button called customer reviews. <laughs> and you want this toaster oven because you've seen that it's good and your friends love it, but there's this draw to say, I've got to push the button on the one reviews and find out why I should not buy this toaster oven that I really want. How crazy are we? I want this good toaster oven, but let me see what everything is wrong about it. Then you call your friends up. Hey, I know you guys have the KitchenAid toaster oven, but did you see all the bad reviews on it? But then when you go and see like the manufacturer's response, it's like you didn't plug it in. 
you didn't remove the styrofoam spacer from inside the toaster oven. That's why it caught on fire. <laughs> right? But someone else's negative review changes your whole desire to have what you believe to be good. Someone else's word. Oh. I believe this to be true, but they lied to me. I'm right and they're wrong. I'm trying to do what's excellent and they're treating me as inferior. And all of that might be true. It might be true that you're trying to live excellent and they're trying to treat you as inferior. That might be true, but it does not have to change what you focus on. You do not have to focus on the fact that they're treating you inferior. Pastor Mike, come on. Are you telling me? Yeah, are you really for real right now? If someone was treating you inferior, are you telling me that that's not going to tick you off? Oh, it's going to bother me. It's going to bother me. But what do I want to choose to focus on? If I focus on that people are trying to treat me inferior, they're probably inferior people because misery loves company. They want me to be just like them. So do I focus on being like them? Or do I focus on winning at life? Do I focus on being more than a conqueror? Do I focus, listen, the Bible says this. If God is for me, who can be against me? What shall man do unto me? What are we gonna focus on? Are we gonna focus on the lesser loser life? Or are we gonna focus on the championing life that Jesus has laid out in front of us. When your mind is going downhill because of us, you're spiraling downhill because you feel the situation is unfair, then I'm gonna tell you, you're not meditating on what is good. It is possible to go through something really bad and still focus on what is good. It is possible. It is possible. So today we're going to go through this list. We're going to study out a few of these words. The first word I want to look at is what is true? The word true. What is true? And I was into bodybuilding for a few years. And if you ever get into bodybuilding or like go into the gym, you you buy muscle magazines, you buy fitness magazines because you want to get recipes and tips and how do I squeeze my tricep? And, you know, then I realized, I found out, That everybody in every single one of those magazines, whether they were like slim or jacked, they were all on steroids. Didn't know that. Found that out. Found out that 99% of every single photo is photoshopped. They slim the waist. They even draw the abs in. Half it's makeup. Oh, like, it's all a lie. I could be in the gym eight hours every day, and I will never look like that. What is true? What is true? And this definition, undeniable reality. The undeniable reality. Listen, you could tell me that you are a car all day long, but just because you want to be a car is not undeniable reality. It's not an undeniable reality. It's just not. It's, it, it's a play on words. That's not true. Well, Pastor Mike, then there's nothing true in the world today and everything's alive. No, I'm going to give you an example of something true. Gravity is true. Gravity is absolute truth. Well, I don't believe in gravity. Um, I'm just a bubble that floats. Okay. I love that. I love that for you. We go out back, we climb a tree, and I'll pray my best. I believe, God, that you can float like a bubble out of that tree. (laughs) But the undeniable reality is, when you jump out that tree, you're going to hit your face on the ground. You're going to hit your face on the ground, then we're going to call the ambulance because you broke your face. (laughs) We didn't invent gravity, y'all. Like, we didn't invent it. If gravity wasn't made in a laboratory, like, we discovered it. 
we realize that there's an undeniable reality of truth called gravity and we are stuck to this planet, especially white people can't jump very high. <laughs> they white people have more gravity than anybody else, right? I will never dunk a basketball because gravity, gravity is an absolute truth. In a world of so many lies, like, I don't know, maybe you have some friends, they are like conspiracy theorists, right? Like, everything's conspiracy. Everything, oh my God, that's the government. Come to my house, I've got a helmet with tinfoil. Boys are getting together, we're gonna hang out, shut your cell phones off. Leave your phone in your car, because we gotta talk about some stuff. That, listen, that might be true. I don't know. But if I, I'm not going to like wear a helmet to be sh like. <laughs> Come on, man. Like just the maintenance of carrying the helmet around all the time. Like for real. Like that's a lot of work. That might be true that there's a lot of conspiracies out there. I'm trying to compose myself. I'm not negating that, but I'm saying I don't want to focus on that and live a miserable life, right? <laughs> Undeniable reality. A lot of times our minds begin to wander and we write stories that aren't true. Why are you looking at me like that? I got a, bo I got a booger in my face? I go, this happened one time. This happened one time. I'm at a food truck one time. I'm gonna get myself a cheesesteak from the food truck. And I'm standing up, I'm like the next in line, and there's this dude grilling me. It's like, mm. like a few feet away from me. And I'm like, yo, what's up with this guy? And I'm like, I look at him and I look back down, you know, I'm a little insecure, because like someone's grilling you, it's just like, man. Looking at me all crazy, right at me. Finally, I'm like, yo, I'm gonna have to say something to this dude. Like, <laughs> obviously, he got some beef with me. You know, like, does he know that I'm a pastor? Maybe he got something going on. Maybe I preached a bad sermon. So finally, like, I can't take it anymore. And I'm like, yo, bro, you got a problem? <laughs> like, what's up? <laughs> Trying to get cheesesteak here. And he's like, and it's just crazy, he's like, what? I'm like, you're grilling me, like, why are you, like, what's up? He goes, I'm not looking at you, I'm trying to see the menu on the side of the truck. <laughs> Whoa. I wrote this whole story in my head. Right, I wrote this whole story, it was like a best-selling novel that we, I was about to get in a fight. I was like shaking hands and everything. You know, you know it, you've been in a fight, you get that shaky hand syndrome, I, I had it. I wrote this, and it wasn't true. The story I was writing in my head wasn't true, and we do it all the time. Your doctor calls, Mr. McKelvey, I need to see you in my office next week. I'm dying. <laughs> my doctor never calls me. Why would the doctor call me? Right? Come to find out it's like an insurance issue and you owe like 50 bucks on the account. But like you wrote the whole story because you didn't know what was going on, right? We do this and we begin to spiral. We create scenarios in our mind that you could not possibly know. You could not possibly know what's going on in someone else's mind. You could not possibly know what's happening and you wrote this story. So how do we know what truth is? Is there any truth in the world tonight? I love this verse in John 14, 6. Jesus is speaking. Jesus answered his people and he said this, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pastor Mike, that's all good and everything, but Jesus don't fix everything. Be careful. Be careful saying he don't fix everything. I would dare say you don't surrender everything. I would dare say that you're making your problem bigger than Jesus. 
I'll say, I'll say that you're giving more power to your ability to fix your situation than you're giving power to God to intervene on your behalf. The word noble, what is noble? Deeply respected because viewed as majestic. We have a problem with this today. We have a problem with honor today. Honor. We have a problem honoring our bosses, our supervisors, the people that we work with. They have a problem with honor. Because we feel like, because I don't like you, I don't have to honor you. Because I don't respect you, because you don't respect me, I don't have to honor you. Listen, I don't have to like somebody to honor the position they hold. I ain't trying to get political. I'm not at all. But we think we can say whatever we want about the office of the, that leads our country. And, and there's no nobility there anymore. There's no honor there anymore. Who would want that job with all of us? There's no honor in it. You couldn't possibly do what's right for everybody anymore. You couldn't possibly. So it doesn't matter to me the person who holds the position, the position is honorable in and of itself. If we can't honor that, I'm just saying straight up, you can't honor God. Because we'll do the same thing. Well, I didn't get what I want in the timeline that I got, so God is a liar. I didn't get what I wanted in the timeline that I wanted it, so God's word doesn't work. How come God's not working as fast as I think he should? How come God isn't like Burger King and giving it to me my way? Right? So we have to think of the things that are noble. What is noble about the position of my supervisor? I mean, moms and dads, you want your kids to honor you. Are you going to get it right every time? No. Are you going to lose your cool and yell one time? Yes. Are you going to make a mistake? Absolutely. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't honor the position. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with the promise that it will be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. That's what scripture says. That doesn't mean you have to like the fact that they made you go clean your room twice. I don't have to like that, but I have to honor the position, right? Focusing on what is noble, what is true, what is right. The word right has the connotation of what is righteous. What is in right standing with God? What is in right standing with the righteous rule of God? Listen, something can be legal in New York, it doesn't make it right. I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. I need to focus on what is right. Just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right for me to do it. Many times we focus on the moments that we feel that we were wronged, that people don't understand me, instead of focusing on what we did right in the situation. Scripture goes on to say whatever is pure. Whatever is pure. What's pure inside and outside? This word pure has this connotation. What is holy? What is holy? And the reality is when you meditate on holy things, it brings a place of peace and refuge on the inside of you. When you focus on the unholy, I promise you anxiety comes with that. Depression comes with that. Self-loathing, self-dissatisfaction comes with meditating and constantly thinking about the things that are unholy. And I'm not saying that that's a punishment of God. It's a consequence of the human action. You cannot constantly violate your, per your personal conscience and feel good about yourself. And God's not, in, not, God's not doing that. God's not making you feel bad. You're viola you violated your own moral compass. And something that begins to happen on the inside of you for yourself. And that's why uh, Paul reminds us in Colossians, he says, set your mind on things above, not earthly things. 
Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. God, this decision that I'm about to make, how does it bring honor to you? You actually make decisions like that? I, I actually do. I actually do. Have I, done, have I made decisions that don't bring honor to God? Absolutely do. But my heart is to make that pause before I make that decision and say, Lord, is this decision that I'm making, is it advancing your kingdom? Is it bringing honor to you? Or is this all about me? Is it all about advancing my kingdom? Is it about advancing my image? Is it about advancing my career? It is possible to advance your career and not be in the will of God. And I'm just going to say, stress and pressure comes with that. Set your mind on things above. The things that we are to meditate on naturally point us to Jesus. And if the things that are good and lovely and pure that we meditate on through Jesus will lead us to his perfect will. And what I know about living in God's perfect will, that's where peace, joy, love, self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit come into play because I'm actually living in the will of God. I'm not standing here to say that I have this all figured out. I'm not standing here saying that I'm the perfect picture of thinking about the greatest things of life. I'm not even saying that any of this is easy. It's probably gonna be the hardest thing you ever had to do, control your thinking. But I can tell you what the truth of the gospel is. If we can do what this word says, it will bring peace that you have never known in your life. It will bring fulfillment that you've never known in your life if we can do what scripture says. We understand that when it comes to any area of our life, Changing habits are not easy, but little changes over time make huge differences. So let me give you three quick points before we leave today. Christ is the lens in which we should view our lives. Christ is the lens. Uh, several years ago, I say several years, this is probably 20 years ago, I'd have to look up when it came out, but there was this, like, these bracelets that everybody was buying, WWJD. Anybody have a WWJD bracelet at one point? Yep, you're an OG Christian. You've been in church a long time, right? WWJ says, what would Jesus do? And it was like, if you're going to make a decision or you're going to do something, look down at your arm. But what would Jesus do? And it got weird, right? It did. It kind of went too far and it all got weird. But the truth of the matter is, if you did pause and ask yourself a question and say, if someone was ridiculing Jesus, how would he respond? Well, he flipped tables over. He did that one time. He flipped tables one time, and it was in protest for the house of God that people were changing the purpose of church to their own personal satisfaction and needs. He never flipped off a sinner. Never. He never combated an unbeliever. He never tried to convince somebody that he was the Messiah. He said, I am. And you want it? Pick up the cross and follow me. And they walked away. And they're like, oh, yo, I don't want to miss out on this. He laid it out. He didn't get emotionally charged. He didn't ruin his day. He didn't get upset. Jesus Christ is the lens. Even in darkness, Jesus has like this special feature. It's like flashlight glasses. Even in the darkest moment of your life, if you put the Jesus glasses on and flip the button, it will bring light into dark places because truth is light. We need some corrective lenses. Check this out, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. We're losing our hair, our beards are turning gray. Yet inwardly we are renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us and, and uh, us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
Amen. Second point, and I, and I hate to burst some like spiritual bubbles here, but like the devil really isn't attacking every single person in this room, right? Like the devil's not omniscient and omnipresent. The devil can't be in all places. He can only be in one place, right? So to think that he's like stopped attacking like world leaders to come attack you, probably not likely. I'm not saying that he isn't using principalities and powers and there are evil things happening. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that's not true. But I'm telling you this, most of our problems is in our mind, the battlefield of our mind. Choosing to think about wrong things, choosing to think about things that are bad over and over and over again, instead of speaking the word of God over our lives. I promise you, you'd find this miracle. The devil would stop messing with you so much if you got in your word every day which kind of means that it's probably not the devil messing with you, right? It's probably that you're watching more of the news than you are reading the Bible. You're probably reading more Facebook than you are praying, right? And whatever you feed on the most will fuel your life. Whatever you feed on the most will fuel your life. So, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers, right? I'm just, it's a reality, if you eat candy every single day, you're gonna get diabetes. But if you eat the, if you eat the proper foods, your, life is gonna, your body is gonna react and you live a healthier life. Same thing with the word of God. What are you choosing to focus your mind on? And then we're given some instructions in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we are to take captive every thought and make it come into obedience to Christ. That's an action. So when a thought comes to our mind that we know is not from God, this is not a true statement of the Bible. We're to take that thought and just, it says captive, like strangle that thought out. I'm not thinking about this. Well, Pastor Mike, that's easy for you because you know, you don't know what my mind does. Oh, you don't know what this mind does. I'm strangling thoughts all day long, right? But it's something that the word of God tells us to do. It's a command to do. Take captive your thoughts. Do not let your thoughts run away with your life. Do not let your thoughts destroy you. Grab a hold of them. Great book written years ago by Joyce Meyer called Battlefield of the Mind. Read it, change your life. Third step, final thing. Follow God's word. Follow God's word. The scripture says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a spiritual GPS, God's positioning system, right? Spiritual GPS. God's word will put you on the right track even when you detour yourself. Redirecting, 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 make a U-turn, Go back to the right road. God, look at scripture. Look from Genesis to Revelation. God does it over and over and over and over again. He repositions his people over and over and over again to get back on the right track. Follow his word. Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. So the Bible is for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of scripture, we might have hope. Scripture should bring your life hope. If you're in a moment where you don't have a lot of hope, do not read the book of Leviticus. That's not what we're talking about right now. Hey, don't, don't go there. What I am saying is scripture at large, instructive scripture brings hope. It brings hope to our lives. If I'm being honest, I work very hard on who I hang out with, who I surround myself with. I personally can't hang out with negative people. I'm already negative. I'm already negative, right? So you get two negatives, that don't make a positive. It makes like a quadruple negative, right? It's like exponentially negative. 
It's like, it's like if you have a cussing problem, you're like, Lord, I'm surrendering my vocabulary to you. I'm not gonna cuss. Then you go hang out with cussers. Like you got your boys and they cuss a lot. Inevitably, within an hour and a half, you're gonna be like, bye, 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 seven words back to back. Where did that come from? Thought I surrendered it to God. Yeah, I get, I get it, but like when you hang around with people that bring the worst out of you, like you might need to cut that off. Let me give you a tip, the word relationship. The last word is ship. Some of your relationships need to sail. Some of your relationships need to sail, right? I mean, are you, that ain't no friend if you cut your friends off. I'm not saying cut your friends off. I'm saying limit the interaction if it's not life-giving and bringing you towards your goals. And now I'm saying to find some new friends. Don't always be the smartest friend in the bunch. Don't always be the most spiritual person in the bunch. I've got friends that I surround myself with that when I'm having a really bad day, we got this texting group and I'm like, blah, 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 here's all my crap. Right? I said crap from stage. Yes, I did. Here's all my crap. And like a couple of them text back, dude, totally get it. I understand it. Praying for you. Other guys like, what is wrong with you right now? And I'm like, didn't you just see all the crap I just said? That's what's wrong with me. Like, bro, you're focusing on the wrong stuff. Remember what the scripture says, and they throw something back at me, right? Because I don't want friends that agree with me all the time. I want someone that calls my card on me, right? So I'm saying, bro, you're like thinking the wrong stuff. Like, look at this. Look at what is good. Look what is right. We got to surround ourselves with the right people. Check this out. Proverbs 13, 20. I'm ending. I know I'm over time. Proverbs 13, 20. Whoever walks with wise will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Does it mean you cut everybody off? No, I'm not saying you cut everybody off. But if you're in a situation, like even you're around family, and you're at a family dinner, and all of a sudden this toxic conversation comes up, and you're being belittled, and you're being talked down to, man, thank you guys, dinner has been great, it's time for me to go. Are you serious? How could you do that? Because I, I love myself. Because I love myself. And you should love yourself. Don't sit there, don't sit there being talked to in an unhealthy way that's bringing destruction to you. Love yourself enough. Say, listen, just because you're undisciplined don't mean I need to be. We're, we're not going here, we're not doing this. Set boundaries and guardrails in your life so that you can think about and meditate on the good things of life. Ultimately, none of this is possible without Jesus in your life. If Jesus is the lenses, then you must first obtain the lenses before you can correct your focus. Come on, somebody. It just makes sense. If Jesus is the lenses, then you have to have Jesus in order to see life this way. Truth of the matter is there's just a lot of people who go to church, but they don't know Jesus. They, 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 they do make an appointment on Sunday to visit his house, but they don't have a relationship. And I understand that, and I'm not putting anybody down, but if there needs to be a freedom and there needs to be a change, it is only the Holy Spirit that can come into your life and bring that real change. He says this to me. He says this to us. Cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. But you need him in your life to do that. You need the friend that you can cast the care to. You need the father that you can run to. The person you can surrender to and give your life to. And if you're watching online, you're in the room and you've never made that decision, you've never opened that door and unlocked that healthy relationship with Jesus Christ, I would love to offer that to you today. Here at Family Church, we do that. We invite Jesus into our lives by praying a prayer. Surrender prayer, salvation prayer, conversion prayer, whatever you want to call it. It's a confession of faith. The Bible says, with the mouth, confession is made, but with the heart, we believe. So if we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, then it demands or commands that we confess that with our mouth. And when we do that, it surrenders our life. Jesus comes into our life begins to change us from the inside out. Are you gonna change tomorrow? Probably not. 
Are all your problems going to go away this week? Probably not. But it's that slow inward change as the Holy Spirit begins to work on different areas of our life that he begins to correct your lenses and your vision to see like him. If you need to pray that prayer today online or in the room, would you repeat this with me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.